Okay. Uh, supplement 36, Mayor Baba says, referring back to page 190, and that's the conclusion of God Speaks. <clears throat> oh, okay. okay. Where, where he says, um, God, God can only be lived. So th that's what this is referring back to, that sentence. God can only be lived. Spiritual paradox, unless and until ignorance is removed and knowledge is gained, parentheses, the knowledge whereby the divine life is experienced and lived, everything pertaining to the spiritual seems paradoxical. God, whom we do not see, we say is real. And the world, which we do see, we say is unreal. In experience, what exists for us does not really exist. And what does not exist for us really exists. We must lose ourselves in order to find ourselves. Thus, loss itself is gain. We must die to self to live in God. Thus, death means life. We must become completely void inside to be completely possessed by God. Thus, complete emptiness means absolute fullness. We must become naked of selfhood by being nothing, so as to be absorbed in the infinity of God. Thus, nothing means everything. Subtitle, Existence is Substance and Life is Shadow. Existence is eternal, whereas life is perishable. Comparatively, existence is what his body is to man, and life is as the cloth that covers the body. The same body changes clothes according to the seasons, time and circumstances, just as the one and eternal existence is always there throughout the countless and varied aspects of life. shrouded beyond recognition by the cloak of life with its multifarious folds and colors is existence unchangeable. It is the garb of life with its veils of mind, energy, and gross forms that shadows and superimposes on existence, presenting the eternal, indivisible, and unchangeable existence as transient, varied, and ever-changing. Existence is all-pervading and is the underlying essence of all things, whether animate or inanimate, real or unreal, varied in species or uniform in forms, collective or individual, abstract or substantial, 
in the eternity of existence, there is no time. There is no past and no future. Only the everlasting present. In eternity, nothing has ever happened and nothing will ever happen. Everything is happening in the unending now. Existence is God whereas life is illusion. Existence is reality, whereas life is imagination. Existence is everlasting, whereas life is ephemeral. Existence is unchangeable, whereas life is ever-changing. Existence is freedom, whereas life is a binding. Existence is indivisible, whereas life is multiple. Existence is imperceptible, whereas life is deceptive. Existence is independent, whereas life is dependent upon mind, energy, and gross forms. Existence is, whereas life appears to be. Existence, therefore, is not life. Birth and death do not mark the beginning or end of life, whereas the numerous stages, states of life, which constitute the so-called births and deaths, are governed by the laws of evolution and reincarnation. Life comes into being only once with the advent of the first dim rays of limited consciousness and succumbs to death only once on attaining the unlimited consciousness of infinite existence. Existence, all-knowing, all-powerful, all present God is beyond cause and effect, beyond time and space, beyond all actions. Marianne, could you please continue? Yes. <clears throat> Existence touches all, all things and all shadows. Nothing can ever touch existence. Even the very fact of its being does not touch existence. To realize existence, life must be shed. It is life that endows limitations to the unlimited self. Life of the limited self is sustained by the mind creating impressions, by energy supplying the impetus to accumulate and dissipate these impressions through expressions, and by gross forms and bodies functioning as the instruments through which these impressions are spent, reinforced, and eventually exhausted through actions. Life is thickly linked with actions. Life is lived through actions. Life is valued 
through actions. Life's survival depends on actions. Life cognizant is actions. Actions opposite in nature. Actions affirmative and negative. Actions constructive and destructive. Therefore, to let life succumb to its ultimate death is to let all actions end. When actions end completely, life of the limited self spontaneously experiences itself as existence of the unlimited self. Existence being realized, evolution and involution of consciousness is complete. Illusion vanishes and the law of reincarnation no longer binds. Simply to desist from committing actions will never put an end to actions. It would merely mean putting into action yet another action, that of inactivity. To escape from actions is not the remedy for the uprooting of actions. Rather, this would give scope to the limited self to get more involved in the very act of escaping, thus creating more actions. Actions, both good and bad, are like knots in the tangled thread of life. The more persistent the efforts to undo the knots of action, the firmer become the knots and the greater the entanglement. Only actions can nullify actions in the same way that poison can counteract the effects of poison. A deeply embedded thorn may be extricated by the use of another thorn or any sharp object resembling it, such as a needle, used with skill and precaution. Similarly, actions are not, sorry, similarly actions are totally uprooted by other actions. When they are committed by some activating agent other than the, quote, self. Karma yoga, Dhyan yoga, Raj yoga, and Bhakti yoga serve the purpose of being prominent signposts on the path of truth, directing the seeker toward the goal of eternal existence. But the hold of life fed by actions is so tight on the aspirant that even with the help of these inspiring signposts, he fails to be guided in the right direction. As long as the self is bound by actions, the aspirant or even the pilgrim on the path toward truth is sure to go astray through self-deception. Throughout all ages, sadhus and seekers Sages and saints, munis and monks, tapasavis and sannyasis, yogis, Sufis and talibs have struggled during their lifetimes 
undergoing untold harsh hardships in their efforts to extricate themselves from the maze of actions and to realize the eternal existence by overcoming life. They fail in their attempts because the more they struggle with their selves, the firmer the selves become gripped by life through actions intensified by austerities and penances, by seclusions and pilgrimages, by meditation and concentration, by assertive utterances and silent contemplation, by intense activity and inactivity, by silence and verbosity, by japas and tapas, and by all types of yogas and chilas. Emancipation from the grip of life and freedom from the labyrinths of actions are made possible for all and attained by a few when a perfect master, Sadhguru or Kutub, is approached and his grace and guidance are invoked. The perfect master's invariable counsel is complete surrender to him. Those few who do surrender their all, mind, body, possessions, so that with their complete surrender, they also surrender consciously their own selves to the perfect master, still have their very being left conscious to commit actions which are now activated only by the dictates of the master. <clears throat> Such actions after the surrender of one's self are no longer one's own actions. Therefore, these actions are capable of uprooting all other actions which feed and sustain life. Life then becomes gradually lifeless and eventually succumbs by the grace of the perfect master to its final death. Life, which once debarred the persevering aspirant from realizing perpetual existence can now no longer work its own deception. Uh, thanks, Marion. Uh, Mahu, are, are you available to read? I guess not yet. I have emphasized in the past, I tell you now, and I shall age after age forevermore, repeat that you should shed your cloak of life and realize existence, which is eternally yours. To realize this truth of unchangeable, indivisible, all pervading existence, the simplest way is to surrender to me completely, so completely, that you are not even conscious of your surrender, conscious only to obey me and to act as and when I order you. If you seek to live perpetually, then crave for the death of your deceptive self at the hands of complete surrender to me. This yoga is the essence of all yogas in one.
subtitle, The Four Journeys. God is infinite and his shadow is also infinite. The shadow of God is the infinite space that accommodates the infinite gross sphere, which with its occurrences of millions of universes within and without the range of men's knowledge is the creation that issued from the point of finiteness in the infinite existence that is God. In these millions of universes are many systems with planets. Some are in gaseous states, some in states of solidification, some of stone and metal, some of which, some which also have vegetation. Some have also developed life forms such as words, some also fish, some also birds, some also animals, and a few also have human beings. Thus it is that throughout the myriads of universes, there are planets on which the seven kingdoms of evolution are manifested and the evolution of consciousness and forms is completed. But only on the planet Earth do human beings reincarnate and begin the involutionary path to self-realization. Earth is the center of this infinite gross sphere of millions of universes inasmuch as it is the point to which all human conscious souls must migrate in order to begin the involutionary path. This involutionary path has seven stations and arrival at the seventh station completes the first journey to God. Although the completion of this journey is the goal of all human souls, only a very few at any given moment embark upon it. The arrival at the end of this journey is the drowning of individuality in the ocean of infinite consciousness. And the journey's completion is the soul's absorption in the state of I am God with full consciousness. And as God, it experiences infinite power, knowledge, and bliss. Out of all the souls who complete the first journey, a very few enter the second journey. This journey has no stations. It is an instantaneous journey, the journey of infinite consciousness being shaken from its absorption in I am God to abiding in God as God. In this state, individuality is regained, but individuality is now infinite. And this infinity includes gross consciousness. And so as man and God, it experiences infinite power, knowledge, and bliss. In the midst, of most finiteness. The unlimited soul knows its unlimitedness in the midst 
of limitation. The third journey is undertaken only by those who have accomplished the second journey and whose lot it is to bear the burden of the exercise of infinite power, knowledge and bliss, and so live God's life, both as man and God, simultaneously. There are only five such masters living on the earth at any given moment, and they control the movement of the universes and the affairs of the worlds of men. Only when one of these five perfect masters drops his body can one of those who are abiding in God as God move onwards and complete the third journey to fill the vacant office. It is the duty of these five perfect masters to precipitate the advent of the ancient one, Avatar, and to hand over to him the charge of his own creation. All those who live God's life on earth and all those who abide in God as God on earth, when they drop their bodies, also shed forever their subtle and mental vehicles and pass away utterly as God, retaining infinite individuality and experiencing infinite power, knowledge, and bliss. This is the fourth journey. In reality, these four journeys are never journeyed, for God has nowhere to journey. He is without beginning and without end. And everything which has the appearance of being appeared from that which has no beginning and passes back into that which has no ending. Mahu, are you, are you back and available to read? Yes, I can read. Awesome. Sure. <clears throat> The world of the astral, there is, no, there is no astral world as such. The astral world is not a portion of the subtle world. However, in between the gross and the subtle worlds, there are seven sheets which form the so-called world of the astral. And this serves as a link between these two worlds. A gross conscious soul may be said to have an astral body, which links the gross with the subtle. The astral may be called the imprint of the subtle over the gross, which imprint is neither gross nor subtle. Page 276. In a sleep, in the ordinary dream state, one experiences the impressions of the gross world with the subtle body, subconsciously, and not with the astral body. All experiences in the world of the astral experience through the medium of the astral body, or as insignificant as dreams. I repeat this again. 
all experiences in the world of the astral experienced through the medium of the astral body are as insignificant as dreams. After disembodiment, the soul experiences the world of the astral in the astral body. This may be said to be the astral journey of the soul. When the soul gets embodied, the astral body is shed and with the new gross body, it gets a fresh astral body. But as long as it does not get embodied, its subtle and mental bodies undergo the experiences of the state of heaven or hell through the medium of the astral body. In accordance with the impressions that were accumulated while it was in an embodied state. The spiritual path begins when, I'm sorry, the spiritual path begins only with the involution of the consciousness. When the soul begins to experience the first plane of the subtle world, and not when it just has access to the astral phenomena from the gross world. At this stage, when the soul experiences fully the first plane of the subtle world, the astral sheath that linked the subtle with the gross is snapped for good. There is a chart, but it's not very, um, doesn't have a clear font. Do you want to read it, Eugene? Uh, uh, you, you, can, you, can you not see it, Mahu? Well, I can see it. Can you enlarge it for some reason? It's... Uh, it's very faint. Yeah, it's yeah, kind it, of it, gray fuzzy. Uh, I can read it. I mean, as, because, you know, we've been reading those all along. It's not that they're new to us. You know, I'm just by looking at it. Yeah, so um, uh, your pronunciation, I, th I, I think, is the best of all of ours. So go ahead and read. Read. Yeah. Okay. So this chart is God realization by man. Means man becoming God eternally. The sphere of reality, the genesis of the gnosis of I am God is common to each one and does not end on physical death. So there is a, a chart with the header being term, status, state, stage or aspect, and gnosis. The first one is the term is Sufi. Status is Azube Kamil. State is Jom or Holate Muhammadi. Stage or aspect is Olame Lahi. Gnosis is Anal Haq. Next, Vedantic. The term is Vedantic. Status is Brahmi Behut. State is Nirvakalpa Samadhi. Stage or aspect is Vidnyan. Gnosis is Aham Barahmasi. The next term is Mystic. Status is Perfect One. State is God. Stage is super consciousness. Gnosis is I am God. Next category, the first one is the term is Sufi. Status is Majsube Soleh or Soleh 
majzub. State is jam alternately with or without fark. Stage is fanal ma'al baqa. Gnosis is anal haq alternately with or without hame ba manast. Next term, Vedantic, the status is paramahansa. State is nirvakalpa samadhi, alternately with or without the consciousness of tribuhan. And the stage is turiya avastanosis is shivaham, shivaham, alternately with or without jivaham. Next term is mystic. The status is divine superman. State is God conscious, alternately with or without creation consciousness. Stage is divine junction. Gnosis is I am God, alternately with or without Everything is with me. Next category, again, the term for the term Sufi. We have, uh, what is this? Uh, we have Azad Mutlaq or Sahib Jamufar and uh, I think it's a, well, anyway, the term, that was a term, then, then is John with Farg, and uh, the state is Fanon al and Gnosis is Anal Haq, Hameba Manast. Vedantic, the term Vedantic, it's Jivan Mukta, Sahaj Samadhi with the consciousness of Tribu One, and state or status is Turiya Avasta, Gnosis is Shivaham with Jivaham. The next term is mystic, liberated, incarnate, God consciousness with, cre with creation consciousness. The term or stat status is divine junction. Gnosis is I am God with, everything is with me. The next is Sufi. The next category, again, the term Sufi is Gotob or Jam or Jam or Farqo Bilah or Farqo Jam. The status is Maqam Muhammadi. Gnosis is an al haq, hame man, hame manam, hame dar manast, and hame az manast, simultaneously. The next term is Vedantic, Sad Guru, Hindi is Sad Guru, Sahaj Samadhi, or um, Atma Pratish. Shapana, Atma Paratashipana, with the duty of Tribuvan. And uh, the state is Vidnian Bahomika. And Gnosis is Shivoham and Sarvoham simultaneously. The next term in this category, mystic again is perfect master, then man god, who are god conscious and creation consciousness simultaneously. That's their state of being. And the gnosis is I am God, and everything is me, in me, and from me simultaneously. There was a note, uh, should I read it? 
This is yes, important. Please. So note is John is consciousness of union with God. John, then there's a note, a footnote. It's called said John is consciousness of union with God. Fark is consciousness of separateness from God. Fark, therefore, implies the consciousness of any or all of the three spheres of being gross, subtle, mental. Hall is the inner experience of relative existence obtains only in the planes in and up through the sixth. There is no hall in the seventh plane. We're done with this table. Go ahead, Mahu. Epilogue. The end. God is everywhere and does everything. God is within us and knows everything. God is without us and sees everything. God is beyond us and is everything. God alone is, which is a masterpiece. And thus ends God Speaks. For this advent, 